Got it. Okay. And uh, I'll be focusing on, on brain organoids with a very provocative question, which is uh, where does cognition begin? And the idea is that to create a useful model where we can study uh, sophisticated networks that might give rise uh, to cognition, self-awareness, uh, and any behavior from, uh, could, could, codified by the human brain. And uh, this is uh, quite hard because we don't even know if a newborn baby is actually self-aware or has any cognition. And we are even trying to, to recapitulate that in a dish so there is many reason to believe that this might not even be possible. So we use this technology of a mini brain in a dish, uh, which has uh, several, of, uh, several limitations. Uh, most of the protocols, they are dealing with immature neurons. These uh, structures are not vascularized. Not all cell types are represented. We don't even know if we're growing these cells in the right condition. So what my lab does is uh, take time to optimize these protocols, optimize uh, how we grow them. And uh, long story short, so it has been like three years that we are optimizing a novel protocol where we can keep these uh, brain organoids in the right conditions and uh, optimized conditions that they can live and survive uh, for months, if not years. And uh, <clears throat> there is uh, several things um, that is important to highlight. Uh, one uh, aspect of that is that when you make these organoids, you don't make a single one, but you make several of them. Uh, here is a, a, a postdoc in the lab uh, growing them, and you can see that, first of all, they are about 0.5 centimeter in diameter, so you can see the naked eye. Uh, they can grow up to two years, and you can grow uh, hundreds, if not thousands of them. But uh, the really big questions that we have is that uh, can this be um, a novel way to understand sophisticated uh, neuronal networks? And uh, this is something that wasn't addressed in, in previous protocols. And we thought that uh, we should be doing that by comparing with uh, previous work. So what I have here is just uh, the mean firing rate. And this is just a measure of uh, overall brain power. And the work that I'm showing here is all the work done with uh, 2D cultures. This is our regular traditional cultures. So most of the work is below uh, 5 hertz um, as, a, as one of the measurements. And uh, we are quite far away from what we consider like a sophisticated network coming from a mouse brain or even a monkey brain. So even brain organoids uh, can be kept at for uh, several weeks uh, in culture. But by doing that, you don't see an increase in the sophistication of the network. They are still below the 5 hertz. So I think the biggest surprise is that when we start growing or using this protocol, over time we see that not only we can uh, speed up um, uh, the maturation of those neurons, but we can reach to a level that is close uh, to a, 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 a functional uh, monkey or mouse brain. So that opens um, different possibilities, um, including the study of neural oscillations that you can only uh, achieve if you have a high power brain activity. So these neural oscillations are important because you can record through the skull. So these are the waves that you see if you put like an EEG cap like this one. And they basically are correlated to virtually any behavior uh, in humans. But to understand what are uh, the age of uh, uh, the organoid, we use these uh, EEG or electroencephalogram uh, features from preterm babies to compare with our brain organoid. And we use the machine learning to do that. So we use an uh, unsupervised uh, learning algorithm to teach um, the machine to tell the age based on the EEG from several preterm babies. And after that, I mean, we start feeding them with our uh, brain organoid electrical activity. And what the machines tell us is that uh, there is a really good prediction uh, after 25 weeks, uh, but really bad prediction before that. And the reason why is that human babies do not survive uh, uh, when uh, it is uh, below 25 weeks, so we cannot, like, teach the machine to predict the age. But after that, I mean, we have a really good prediction and uh, what we learn is that our brain organoids, if uh, captured capture properly in, in, in culture, they will mimic uh, something that resembles a postnatal human brain. So we can reach that level of uh, oscillations. So now that we have these oscillations in a dish, I mean, we start uh, asking, can we use these brain organoids uh, to test drugs for conditions where these oscillations are uh, affected, for example, in autism or in schizophrenia? So this is a, a company, a startup, that I'm a co-founder, uh, that we are using these uh, brain oscillations as a readout for these drug screening platforms. 
So another perspective uh, of these oscillation is that uh, they kind of reach a plateau after nine months, and this is what we expect for the human brain. I mean, when we have like a baby that was just born, uh, it's still like an immature brain. And um, the only way for this brain to mature is to have input or output. <clears throat> So the way we decided to do that was uh, to plug these brain organoids into robots. So we are teaching the robots to interpret uh, the oscillations that are coming from these uh, brain organoids and explore the world. So as they explore the world, we are creating like a neurofeedback using optogenetics or pulsing them with neurotransmitters so they can start learning something. So uh, what we have here is a video. I think you can play the video. Uh, of uh, the initial attempt uh, to make a robot learning using these uh, brain organoids. So what you have here in the video, if you can just play it, uh, it is uh, 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 the organoids are actually not inside the robot. They are in the lab, but they are sending signals to a computer who sends uh, the codification for the movement to the computer, to the robot wireless. And it takes about 10 seconds to do that. So we are trying to uh, reduce the speed of that. And, and again, I mean, um, uh, if you're not impressed with this movement of the robots, you should, because that's exactly what uh, a learning uh, uh, network is trying to do. It's trying to uh, optimize and explore the environment. So we hope that this would be like another learning paradigm to explore uh, uh, drugs for autism or schizophrenia, for example. So you know, I'll, uh, if you can go back to the slides. I'll finish uh, with uh, one more potential applications uh, because we talk about uh, translational opportunities using these brain organoids. But there are more um, basic sciences uh, that can be done. Um, let me move to my last slide, which is uh, something that we will be discussed here in these sessions, uh, the use of genome editing uh, to learn more about uh, how these sophisticated networks uh, emerge. Um, We've been uh, editing these brain organoids. One more. In different ways. First, we are using um, CRISPRs to knock down important genes that might be important uh, for the emergence of the networks. But we also are taking an like, evolutionary approach. So this is just like an article from today from Science Magazine showing uh, our attempts to neanderthalize a human brain organoid so we can go back in time and create uh, organoids that have uh, DNA material from the Neanderthals. So by doing that, we can understand uh, how the Neanderthal mind or brain complexes start to uh, diverge from the modern humans. And what we find is super interesting, but I'll keep that as a teaser for a, another talk. So I'll, I'll stop here and I'll move to the second speaker, uh, which is Matthias, that we will be talking about organoids in a different tissue the GI tract. Thank you very much. So I would like to give you a, perhaps a bit uh, more general perspective on organoids. I would like to put them in context with existing in vitro systems as well as uh, organisms or animals to see what, what we can really do with organoids at the moment. So I've I think organoids can be defined as miniature tissues that capture key features of, of real tissues in terms of their architecture, the cellular composition, and to some extent, the function. And I think a beautiful example of, of, uh, of an organoid is that of, of the gut. This is uh, work that has been pioneered by Hans Klever's lab in the Netherlands. Here you can see basically in vivo, our gut is a meter long tube that's lined with a, a, a layer of uh, epithelial tissue, which has a very characteristic topography with these long protrusions that stand out here that are called the villi, and these little uh, 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 cavities that are called the crypts. And our stem cells in the gut that have a, a really tremendous turnover because this tissue is used so much, the cells are dividing very rapidly and generate specialized cell types uh, uh, constantly in these, in these tissues. So the, the stem cells are basically located here in the crypts. They start to uh, uh, differentiate and specialize and generate the specialized cell types that are responsible for the absorptive and secretory function of the tissue that are located up here in the villi. So if you remove the stem cells from these tissues and you put them in a 3D 
environment and you give them the right cocktail of factors, something very magic happens in that the stem cells start to divide and give rise to these little cystic structures, like uh, small epithelial uh, tissues that further differentiate and then give rise to these structures that mimic remarkably well the crypts. So they, they also have stem cells in them, and these stem cells give rise to uh, differentiated cells that retain the key functions of the tissue. So this is what we can call uh, a minigot. And I think it's important to distinguish this, this advance of organoid biology and technology from traditional in vitro culture. And I think we can perhaps distinguish three main aspects here. So traditionally, we, we, we grow cells in culture from one type. We can, we can combine multiple cells, but very often we, we grow them as a single cell type and uh, in, the, in, in classical cell culture dishes. In organoids, multiple cell types coexist, and very often we have stem cells that live together with specialized cell types in the same three-dimensional structure. This is what makes them much more in vivo-like than a traditional cell culture setting. And so the architecture of the tissue, this is really capturing some of the complexity of the tissue also in terms of its, its makeup. It's much more physiological in an organoid system compared to a traditional in vitro setting. And as a consequence of these aspects here, we can capture uh, more physiological functions in vitro compared to traditional cell cultures. And I think that's the reason why organoids, and we hope that this is going to happen, can really fill this large gap between in vitro experiments that we're doing in the lab and the organism, an animal, doing in vivo experiments. This is really the hope that we can bridge this tremendous uh, gap here. I think it's important to realize that organoids can be derived from multiple sources, so we can isolate adult stem cells from tissue and basically generate organoids from these cells. But we can also uh, derive organoids from cells that are called pluripotent stem cells, which can either be embryonic stem cells or induced pluripotent stem cells. And we also have the possibility now to derive organoids from sort of cells that are in between these stages of the adult and then the embryo that are, that are called fetal progenitor cells. This is important because the organoids that are generated depend on the type of cell of origin in terms of their maturity or developmental stage. So if we derive organoids from pluripotent stem cells, we can either generate embryonic-like organoids, or we can, we can derive more specialized organ-like structures that are sort of not reaching the adult level at the moment. They're sort of more in a, in a fetal stage, I would, I would say. However, adult stem cells, when we generate organoids from those, they probably are closer to the real adult tissues in terms of their uh, functionality. And we also have the possibility to use cancer stem progenitor cells to derive structures that could be called cancer organoids or tumoroids. So the cell source uh, plays an important role. And what is, what is now the potential of, of organoids? I think, as we have seen just before, Organoids represent a very, very important experimental tool to the, for the biologists. This is already very clearly shown. There is a huge hope that we can use organoids for diagnostics, drug discovery, ultimately cell therapy. And we have important proof of concept studies that have already been published on multiple organoid systems that suggest that this will become a reality and will be routinely done in the future. I think it's important to point out that organoids give us a unique opportunity to study human biology and human diseases in a dish, where we don't have uh, a possibility to work on an organism. We can't do real experiments on human embryos. So this is really, I think, perhaps the most exciting aspect of, of organoid technology. I think what we are seeing now is also that there is quite a lot of hype that uh, surrounds organoids because of the expectations that we have and because, of, because there is so much at stake with these systems. And I think we should not be fooling ourselves and think that we can really generate real organs at the moment. We're not really there. And I would also say that in general, of course, what, we're, what we expect is that organoids will reduce animal experimentation, 
but they cannot replace completely uh, animals that are used for, for biological studies. So I think this is something uh, important to keep in mind. Now, I think there is a tremendous opportunity here to improve organoid technology further. And in this context, I think engineering approaches can play an important role to solve some of the challenges that we are now encountering with, with organoids. The first one, I've um, uh, shown here a list of issues that I think need to be addressed in the, in the future. One clearly is reproducibility. Our organoids at the moment show a quite a bit of a heterogeneity in terms of size and shape, etc. This can be improved by controlling the culture conditions even better. Uh, we, we have organoids that, uh, that are not really physiological in terms of size, shape, they don't reach a lifetime uh, that, that we would like to have in terms of deriving really mature adult tissues. They also lack complexity. You know, if you think about the real organ uh, and, and go back to the intestine as a model system, here we just represent the outermost layer of, of the organ, the epithelium. We don't have blood, blood system, we don't have nerves, we don't have immune components etc., etc. So there is a lot of things still lacking in terms of complexity that will need to be engineered back into a system in order to capture true organ-level physiology. And in that context, I think engineering has made a lot of advances over the last years, and there is a whole field that is called organs on chips, where, where, where scientists and engineers are trying to recreate physiological functions of organs using very clever microtechnology. And in this context, for instance, there have been studies from Boston showing that you can mimic breathing motions of the lung by, by engineering micro devices in which cells from the lung can be cultured and, and thereby capture some functionality of, of the liver. And so I think bridging or merging together microtechnology and engineering with organoid biology is, is a very uh, exciting avenue in the, in, in the future. This is what I wanted to talk about. So with that, I hand over to, Shu, to Rossi Gage or Shu Bing Shen. Hey, hi, uh, morning everyone. Um, I'm Shi Bing Chen from Bell Cornell. So um, here I will give you some introduction how we use CRISPR technology and combine with stem cell platform to use it for the drug discovery or precision medicine. So I will first show you a movie um, that basically give you some brief introduction about the mechanism of CRISPR-based gene editing. The CRISPR-Cas9 system is a tool for cutting DNA at a specifically targeted location. The technique has already revolutionized gene editing, but scientists are always looking for new possibilities. So what else can CRISPR do? Since being discovered in a bacterial immune system, CRISPR-Cas9 has been adapted into a powerful tool for genomic research. There are two components to the system, a DNA cutting protein called Cas9 and an RNA molecule known as the guide RNA. Bound together, they form a complex that can identify and cut specific sections of DNA. First, Cas9 has to locate and bind to a common sequence in the genome called a PAM. Once the PAM is bound, the guide RNA unwinds part of the double helix. The RNA strand is designed to match and bind a particular sequence in the DNA. Once it's found the correct sequence, Cas9 can cut the DNA. Its two nuclease domains each make a nick, leading to a double strand break. Although the cell will try to repair this break, the fixing process is error prone and often inadvertently introduces mutations that disable the gene. This makes CRISPR a great tool for knocking out specific genes. 
But making double-strand breaks isn't all CRISPR can do. Some researchers are deactivating one or both of Cas9's cutting domains and fusing new enzymes onto the protein. Cas9 can then be used to transport those enzymes to a specific DNA sequence. In one example, Cas9 is fused to an enzyme, a deaminase, which mutates specific DNA bases, eventually replacing cytidine with thymidine. This kind of precise gene editing means you could turn a disease-causing mutation into a healthy version of the gene, or introduce a stop codon at a specific place. But it's not all about gene editing. Several labs have been working on ways to use CRISPR to promote gene transcription. They do this by deactivating Cas9 completely so it can no longer cut DNA. Instead, transcriptional activators are added to the Cas9 by either fusing them directly or via a string of peptides. Alternatively, the activators can be recruited to the guide RNA instead. These activators recruit the cell's transcription machinery, bringing RNA polymerase and other factors to the target and increasing transcription of that gene. The same principle applies to gene silencing. A crab domain fused to the Cas9 inactivates transcription by recruiting more factors that physically block the gene. A more outside-the-box idea for using CRISPR is to attach fluorescent proteins to the complex so you can see where particular DNA sequences are found in the cell. This could be useful for things like visualising the 3D architecture of the genome or to paint an entire chromosome and follow its position in the nucleus. CRISPR has already changed the face of research but these new ideas show that what's been achieved so far could just be the tip of the iceberg when it comes to CRISPR's potential. Whatever comes next, it seems the CRISPR revolution is far from over. So um, basically, CRISPR-based uh, um, gene editing approach, uh, there are two components uh, in the CRISPR-based gene editing. So um, CRISPR, first they have an enzyme called Cas9, and then uh, it's combined with uh, um, guide RNA. So guide RNA will basically help to recognize the location in the genomic DNA, and then basically drive Cas9 to the place that we want to edit it. And what Cas9 will do is Cas9 will basically uh, cut the genomic DNA, and then uh, then the the DNA start to be to start the self repair. But the problem is there are errors happen during the repairing process. So then uh, some errors will cause the uh, frame shift mutation of the genomic DNA, and then they uh, knock out the gene and lost the function. And another type of uh, editing is that people can deactivate the Cas9. So the uh, guide RNA can still uh, drive the deactivated Cas to the editing position. But this time, they can add some other um, enzyme that can change the um, one single nucleotide. This called, we call it process gene editing that can cause the mutation um, in uh, the cell types. So as I said, there are mainly two types of um, gene editing approach. One is to um, knock out the gene, and the other one is to induce the mutation, uh, induce mutation or crack a mutation. When people talk about CRISPR and stem cells, I mean, uh, a lot of application, uh, a lot of emphasis go to cell replacement therapy. Basically, we take um, patient samples, and then we reprogram into propotency stage, we call it in, uh, induced propotent stem cells, and then we can use CRISPR to uh, precisely crack uh, crack the mutation in this uh, propotent stem cells, and now uh, we get these crack cells, they have the uh, healthy or normal uh, genomic uh, DNA. And then the cells can be directed to a certain tissue or organs and put it back into patient for cell replacement therapy. 
But this is one application. But in today's talk, I will talk about another application. If we combine the CRISPR technology and stem cell technology, we actually have a unlimited of cells that we can use for drug discovery or precision medicine. So uh, what is precision medicine? This is an idea brought up several years ago, and it was also back to 2015, it's uh, proposed by um, President uh, Obama. So uh, the idea is that if we know the genomic information of the patient, then the doctor can uh, suggest some drugs, personalized drugs, based on their genomic information. So as uh, these personalized drugs are supposed to be uh, more efficient and less toxic, so there's a lot of interest on that in the last several years. Um, there's a lot, um, both in academia and the industry, a lot of effort has been made on the sequencing part. And now we have a huge database with all this genomic uh, sequencing data. But a, the, a little bit unbalanced part in this precision medicine is the drug discovery. If we check the uh, FDA approved drug library, very limited number of drugs are target, uh, are designed to target specific mutation or specific genes. Why is that? It's just some historical reason. So if we go to the genome-wide association, association study, a lot of gene and mutations are associated with certain diseases. But without a very efficient and precise gene editing approach, it's very difficult to uh, study the single mutation and uh, understand their biological function. So let's come out to the uh, second application um, of this technology. So now we can, again, take patient samples and pay, put, uh, put it back into uh, induced propotent stem cells. And we can do CRISPR-based correction. So we, have, we call it isogenic line. And these two lines, most of their genomic information are identical. The only difference is one single mutation or a loss of one single gene. And now we can uh, differentiate this pair of cells into the tissue organs we are interested in. And we can see what kind of cellular defect they have. And we can even run a drug screening and to find some small molecules that can be particularly correct this defect. So in addition to correction of the uh, patient-specific proponent stem cells, we can also use the healthy cells and we can uh, knock out a gene, or even we can induce a disease causal mutation. So that's another way we can use study the um, function of bi biological function of one gene or one mutation. So now I will show you um, two examples that uh, we use it to uh, identify some drug candidate that can target some uh, specific gene and mutations uh, in disease progression. So the first story is about diabetes. So in this scenario, uh, the gene study has identified around 100 genes associated with type 1, type 2 diabetes. But for most of the genes, we really don't know their biological function. So we start from a human um, propotent stem cell, and we knock out the gene called CDKL1, and we make estrogenic diabetes iPS cell, um, uh, embryonic stem cell, and we differentiate them in pancreatic beta cells. Now we kind of monitor their biologic function. The major function of pancreatic beta cell is to respond to glucose stimulation. In the wild type cell, they can get around twofold induction. But in the knockout cells, they basically lose the response to glucose stimulation. So there's one defect we saw. And the other one is we also culture these cells in uh, some diabetic-like conditions. We challenge them with high glucose, with like um, high lipid, uh, lipid condition. And we find that actually interesting, the CDKL1 knockout cells, they cannot really handle the stress very well. So they basically die more in the disease condition. So in, uh, the interesting part is in regular culture condition, we don't really see any obvious defect. It's more related with type 2 diabetes. So then we run a drug screening. We screen around uh, 2,000 compounds. This is our primary screening data. And we find uh, one small molecule that actually can correct this defect. And when we tr treat the cell with this small molecule, we can see it brings the cell apoptotic rate back to the level comparable to wild type cells. It also brings the cell function back to the level compared to wild type cell. The interesting part is drug doesn't really have any effect on the wild type cells, which highlights the significance is uh, specific for this particular gene CDKL1. Now we, cannot, we are making a panel of iPS cell lines, have a different diabetes gene and different diabetes associated mutations, and to see um, how, um, what the mechanism of these genes and whether we can find the different drugs to correct them. 
And what else can we do? Another model we are trying to establish we call is humanized mice for drug testing. In the drug discovery field, more than 90% of drug people identified ex vivo actually doesn't work in vivo. So that's the reason we need animal models. We can use small animal models, mouse or rats. We can use larger animal models, uh, monkey or pig. But animals are not human. So some drugs, particularly some diabetes drugs, even though they work very well in the animal models, but they still fail in um, clinical trial. So what, what we are trying to do is now we still start from proponent stem cells. Uh, we uh, use CAS to knock out the diabetes gene, and we make beta cells, and now we actually transplant into mice. And we can use some drug can uh, specifically kill the mouse beta cells. Now the mouse are carrying human beta cells. They are totally dependent on the human beta cells to maintain their blood glucose levels. So then we can uh, monitor their function. We can see the insulin secretion. If we transplant the wild type cells, so the cell can respond very well to glucose stimulation. But for the knockout cells, they cannot respond very well. But if we treat these mice with the drug for around four, month, four weeks, actually they regain the ability to respond to glucose stimulation. And the cell uh, we transplanted, we find it can survive very well for up to one year in the mouse model. So we can use this humanized mice model to perform the long-term uh, testing for the efficacy and the toxicity. So in addition to the uh, 2D culture, humanized mice model, we are also interested in organoid model. So this is an example we used to study colorectal cancer. And colorectal cancer is a very aggressive disease, and they have an inherited form. It's basically if patient carry mutation of APC gene, uh, most of patients in this family, they develop colorectal cancer around uh, 20 years old. And there is really no treatment to this patient other than surgery. So they call family FAP patients. So we derive, uh, we get fibroblasts from these patients, and we differentiate into induced pluripotent stem cells, and then we make 3D organoids as, um, as like uh, um, pluripotent stem cell derived organoids, and we basically monitor their cell proliferation. We find that in the colorectal cancer patient derived organoids, uh, the cell proliferate much faster than the wild type organoids. And then we actually uh, perform a drug screening. It's a relatively small scale uh, drug screening. And we find one small molecule is actually can rescue the over proliferation of the colorectal cancer uh, IPSL derived uh, organoids to the level that are comparable to wild type cells. And it's very important that the same condition in the same condition, the drug doesn't really cause any defect in the uh, wild type organoids because um, uh, cytotoxicity is a major side effect of most of chemotherapy um, drugs. So today I just show you um, two examples. We can use CRISPR-based gene editing to make isogenic human proponent stem cells, and we can use it to uh, differentiate into 2D to different type uh, to the cell type we're interested in. We can uh, put it in human uh, to uh, sorry put it in mice to make like humanized mice model. And then the 2D cells can be used for drug, screen, uh, drug screening, and the humanized mice model can be used for the drug evaluation in vivo. And we also can get uh, organoids that we can use for uh, drug testing and small pallet drug screening. And we are trying to adapt it to th uh, more, more higher throughput now. Uh, what are missing? So I think we still need to do a better job on the gene targeting part. Right now, knockout gene is very, very efficient, but knocking single SNFs uh, is not, not good enough. Another thing is we want less off-target uh, gene targeting approach, because if we target several sites, it definitely will be a problem. And another thing we are working on that is, I think is very important is for this disease modeling, we have to understand how to differentiate the stem cells into the cell types or organoids we are interested in and make sure they are functional. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. So I will pass it to Rusty. Thank you, Shivan. Yeah. I'm interested in uh, neurogenesis. That's how cells are emerge from a primitive state, it's like a stem cell through an intermediate neural progenitor cell, and then how they differentiate into more mature cells. And uh, we've done this a lot in, in mouse, and we've done this in monolayers, moving to human in monolayers using this IPS technology that we've heard about. But more recently, 
uh, many of us are moving toward this three-dimensional structure with hopes that the organoids will provide a, uh, a more realistic insight into the function of the human brain. There we go. So this is basically the point I was making here. So we learn a lot about um, biology was disease and normal uh, maturation using mouse models. And, uh, and these are the uh, 2D IP IPS cells, which I think both of these models are still very valuable and things that uh, we, learn, we learn a lot from. In particular, while the disadvantage of having a, a, a monocell or a couple cells in the dish is that they're unrealistic, the, the advantage is that we can really focus in on that cell's function and watch it in, in, in great detail. Uh, the recent advances in three-dimensional structure of uh, cells allows us to do this uh, uh, 3D culture. Now, I put all three of them up here because um, it's n none of them are replacing each other. They're all working cooperatively, and depending on the question that you're asking. But in this session, we're, we're going to focus on the advantages of, of the organoids. The organoids are newer, and uh, they're coming along, and a lot more work is needed to improve them. So they have some, some uh, disadvantages right now, or let's say problems that need to be resolved. So let's see, yeah. So here's uh, an example uh, of the normal human cortical uh, structure. This is sort of the, at the, from a ventricular zone out to the outer edges of the cortex, and this is the mouse. And that's why uh, you can see that it's important if we really want to understand things like cortical development, cortical organization, we need to use the human because it's much more complex than the mouse. These are both in vivo settings. So far, our human organoids are a good representation of a very early form of cortical development, but they don't, don't, they don't give us a full maturation. And it's partly, as Allison said, that they, the survival of the cells in, uh, in this 3D structure is limited. But nevertheless, one can see these three-dimensional structures forming where you have this uh, ventricular-like zone here with the primitive cells, and then on the outer edges, the more mature cells are formed in MAP2. So um, one of the problems that we encountered when we, were, when we were working with organoids initially was that they grow fairly large, and what you begins to see in the core of the organoids, at least the cerebral organoids, is there's a, a necrotic core that occurs if you allow them to get too big. If you keep them small uh, by cutting them periodically, and, and you can get access to the nutrients to the core of them, but otherwise they are um, they have a problem in some cases. But also, as the other speakers alluded to, there's significant amount of variability, so it doesn't happen in all cases. But it's something that we wanted to address. Now, the reasons for this, uh, we believe are that they are not vascularized, so the nutrients are not getting into the core of it, so how do we do that? Now, I, I should say that there are engineering institutes all over the world that are putting enormous amounts of effort to build a synthetic vascular system or ventricular system inside the core of this uh, uh, organoid, uh, and I have to admit that I'm not, we're not qualified as bioengineers to do that sort of work, and I suspect this success will come from that area. But we decided to take another approach at trying to get some vascularization. And it harks back to an old biological study that I had performed back uh, about uh, 35 years ago, where we were using, the, the in this days, the rodent brain as an incubator for uh, human cellular tissues. Uh, they weren't IPS cells or organoids, but chunks of tissue that we wanted to get them survive and vascularize. And so uh, a few years ago, together with a, a postdoc in the lab, we began to consider the application of this uh, in vivo setting as a way to maintain the survival, help the survival of these cells. Now, um, what we use is a standard uh, procedure for making organoids that uh, Lancat, Madeline, Lancaster, and Noblish used, but we can use other uh, methods for making different types of organoids that have different types of cells. We label all the human organoids in green so we can visualize them quite easily, and we mature the cells in culture for about 50 days so that they form a nice sphere, and then we implant them into this cavity that's made. Now, the unique features of this cavity are that they have a, a vascular bed overlying the top of a structure called the superior colliculus. And that is, it's, when it's in its undamaged state, it's 
the vasculature is a rich source of nutrients. And in the past, we had seen that that vascularization can emerge into the, the human tissue. We wanted to see if that would occur in the vascular in our uh, tissue as well. Now, another feature of this that's useful is that in vivo, we have um, an, an imaging system that allows us to use um, high-resolution microscopy and watch the organoid in vivo over time as it matures. And since we've labeled all the human cells green, we can distinctly visualize them independently of the mouse. So this gives us an opportunity to look at live imaging. So here you can see uh, an organoid at, at one day after implantation, and already by 10 days you can see blood surface on the surface of it as we look down on it from the top. Um, an, an immediately as we uh, started looking at these cells, we began to see markers for CD31, which is a, an indicator of a vascular endothelial type cell, and we saw structures inside the organoid uh, indicating that there was some sort of vascularization was taking place uh, even uh, as early as 14 days uh, post-implantation. That's what DPI stands for. So to determine whether or not the, the, the actually actu uh, actually vascularized the cells, we injected a, a rhodamine dye uh, dextran beads into the blood system of the rodent, and then we visualized using this uh, deep microscopy into the organoid, and we watched, uh, we, could, we could visualize in the organoid and see blood vessels uh, that had encapsulated the red dye, showing that the organoid had been uh, vascularized. An important feature of this is that you can see these green cells on the surface of the vascular shows uh, forming the, the blood-brain barrier, or forming the, the, the surface around it, and these are likely, these are human cells by virtue of the fact that they're green. Um, go back in. Yeah. So, um, so it suggests that not only is it vascularized, but what we call a blood-brain barrier is formed because the dye is not leaking out into the surface. So we can now uh, up, supply nutrients to the inner core of this, uh, of this system. Now, in addition to uh, being able to, to demonstrate they're vascularized, we can also use this same imaging system to visualize the functionality of these cells. So here, 180 days after the post-implantation, uh, so they're about 150 days now, we can label the cells with a calcium dye uh, that is targeting mature neurons and monitor the activity of these cells. And here you can see uh, that the neurons within the organoid are spiking in synchrony, uh, suggesting that they're interconnected with each other, so some level of maturation is occurring. The, the, the usefulness of this is that we can actually come back to the same location in the rodent uh, brain imaging of this human tissue over time, so we can monitor the changes that occur in those same circuits that are there. So uh, we, we, the summary of this is we believe that we can say that these human cerebral organoids are amenable to transplantation in the rodent brain. Uh, they survive for long periods of time. We've looked at them for at least a year out after implantation, so it's a year plus 50 days. They become vascularized, and it looks like a blood-brain barrier is formed so that we can achieve nutrients in there. And uh, they're functionally integrated. I, I would say that I didn't show you today, but not only is there evidence for um, innervation of the neurons with each other within the human organoid, but we have evidence that there's functional synaptic uh, connections between the organoid and the host, and the host and the organoid that we're exploiting a little bit currently. So thank you very much. Um, Rusty, what time do you have to run? Um, I was going to say 12.30, so about nine minutes. Okay. So uh, I think if anybody has questions, we should probably start with Rusty. And if not, I will start kind of a discussion. So one thing that, um, and this is for you, Rusty, um, I didn't realize in the beginning is that the blood vessels are not coming from the mouse, but they are being created inside the organoid. Yeah. So it means that there are endothelial cells uh, inside the organoid. So when you start making them and, and transplant, 
they already have the different uh, germline structures in there. Is, is, is that right? Yeah, these are, these are um, so actually in 2004, we showed that neural progenitor cells can, under certain stress conditions, generate endothelial cells. So that's part of the story that emerges here. Right. I wouldn't say that, while it does look very green, we're doing ultrastructure right now, uh, looking at this in, in a lot more detail. And I would not be surprised if these are chimera, that there is some migration from the mouse in there, even though it looks very dark green. Right. Yeah. But uh, there's probably some chimera. We see this also in tumor formation sometimes, where the, the glioblastomas can form their own. They can contribute to their own endothelial vascularization. But if you look closely, you see some of the um, host migration into there as well. So it is a, it is a bit of a chimera. I don't know how much yet, mm -hmm. uh, but we're, you know, actually, actually one of the things that's fun about this is we can watch um, the emergence of angiogenesis. We can watch how blood brain barriers are formed. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the sort of the basic things that I think this has value for is that that's, there aren't, there are very few cases where we can look at human brain vascularization forming, and uh, we're hopeful that this is her. I did, in a little more detail, not only do you have these large large veins, but there's also the, all the microvasculature is, is pretty apparent too, and they're also forming blood brain barrier. Mm -hmm. The EM, I think, is going to be really important to say what are the constituents, what right. are the other cell types that are contributing to it. Right. Uh, another follow-up question. If you now transplant these cells into the kidney capsule or other regions <laughs> in the animals, would you see the same thing, or you need kind of a brain uh, yeah. environment? Yeah, you know, I, I really don't know, but I remember, you know, 10, 15 years ago when we first showed that the neural progenitor cells could give rise to endothelial cells. At that same time, others were showing that other stem cells could give rise to endothelial cells of the organ that they were transplanted in. So it looks like the local environment, and, and they have different properties in the different organs that they, they are transplanted to. So I haven't done that experiment, but it would be interesting to see and then isolate the endothelial cells that are made, say, in the kidney capsule or some other organ and see if they have features that are unique to the organ that they're transplanted. Okay, good, good. I'll, 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 I'll go to Matthias. Matthias, uh, one aspect that I think it's uh, fascinating, it is this idea of a tissue in a ship, right? And uh, you, you heard, like, talks about brain organoids and you are doing, like, uh, the gut organoid. And there are several conditions now that are becoming apparent where there is a gut brain access. So do you think we can recapitulate that uh, in a ship? These are early days. So, uh, one of the challenges to find conditions where we can grow these cells, uh, you know, happily inside a micro device. That's turned out to be more difficult than the field believed. And one challenge is that the, the materials that are used to a large extent are kind of very synthetic, so they're like polymers that have elastomeric properties, which is very useful to make chips, but for the cells to grow in them and, and start to self-organize has been quite a bit of a challenge. Mm -hmm. So I think one interesting uh, avenue there is to replace in these micro devices these traditional materials with completely biological environments, with, with soft materials that are used to grow organoids conventionally. So this, this merging of, of sort of the biological world with the synthetic world has to be done in, 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 in the coming years to, to make something uh, as complex as you, as you, as you mm -hmm. suggest. But I think eventually we'll, we'll get there. Yeah. But there's some, a number of technical and biological challenges. And also, once you start to combine different tissues with each other, one other challenge is what's the right media to grow these different right. cell right. types or you know, organ-specific culture conditions that, that at the moment this isn't something that's, that's quite hard to do. Right. You know, it's a lot of experimentation to identify suitable media to grow different tissues uh -huh. in the same compartment. You know. and, um, and it's still, I mean, the, the, the brain gut uh, acts communication doesn't happen directly, but through signals, through right? Long range signals. And, yeah. and, and, and also, like, from signals coming from the microbiome. And I understand that one of the goals of your research is really to populate these uh, mini guts with different types of microbiome. Is that uh, going on in your lab? Exactly. That's one area where we are very excited about is to try to open these cystic organoids that are very hard to access. The lumen, this is where the action you know, takes place, where the micro 
uh, the bacteria are growing to open them up so that they can become easy, easily accessible and we can, we can you know, perturb them in much more controlled uh, matter. So what we're doing in the lab is to turn a cystic organoid structure into one that's a tube, which is open on both ends. So you can connect it to a fluidic system, <laughs> to colonize it with bacteria, to remove them, to, to, to perfuse drugs, etc. So everything becomes experimentally much more tractable and we have I think made some important progress along along those lines yeah that's yeah. really cool in um, going to the precision medicine aspect right I mean it's fascinating that uh, you can do uh, all the precision medicine uh, in vitro and find drugs that might um, compensate the mutations right but um, I, I think there is also some expectations that one day these would be to be, be doing in vivo as well. So how far are we from using uh, genome editing in vivo? What, what, what's your take on that? Yeah, I think for the uh, in vivo part, definitely it's a huge group in the CRISPR-based gene editing part. People are working on that. And I think the first thing is efficiency, right? It right. really depends on the cell type people want to target. Because for us, we cannot work on the petri dish and the cell are culture and 2D culture right. would be easier. And for your system, in 3D culture, it's already more complicated, but if in the whole human body. And it's uh, efficiency and specificity. I think that's are the two major issues. People need to solve to do the in-vivo-based gene targeting. And talking about specificity in your experiments, I mean, how do you control for off-targets? How, how, how do you validate what you had is really because of that specific mutation and not something else? Yes, so the ideal case, you can do the whole genome sequencing to validate there's no off-target effect, but practically it's just too expensive, too expensive. to do all of them. So we usually use two approach to, um, to decrease the off-target effect. One is we always have several clones from each gene knockout or SNPs lines. So, so in that scenario, the chance to have off-target effect will be a little bit. Uh, they, if they even they have different off-target effect, they may have different, uh, they may target different locations. Mm -hmm. But if we see the same phenotype from multiple lines, most likely it come from our major target. And the second way we usually do is we, uh, on the CRISPR website, you can actually predict the uh, high risk of target effect. And we sometimes we kind of sequence the top 10 or maybe top 20 to make sure the um, most risky areas, they are fine. Yeah. Okay. Do we have a question? I just had a question about um, the organoid technology specifically. It's fairly new. It's pretty new. And so I'm wondering if there are any um, established processes or procedures or media that are used on a regular basis in other words, is there anything that is now making th the organoid development a uniform thing so that it can actually um, be standardized? Yeah. You I, I think it's a, it's a key point for the field to work on standardized uh, materials. And I think there are a number of companies who are very active in this field and have commercialized media and entire kits to grow organoids. And this seems to work quite well as far as I heard from people who are using it and I think it's an important step to make uh, organoid technology widely accessible and, and really fit for real life application in industry and, and so forth. But I'll, I'll add on that as well because I mean as you pointed out it's such a young field that in, in one side you want to create something more robust, reproducible among labs, on the other side you don't want to uh, block the creativity. I mean this new protocol that we had was almost like uh, by chance, people kind of empirically testing uh, other conditions and end up um, gain functional uh, uh, sophistication in the networks by media optimization or, or changing some factors. So it, it, it goes in both directions, right? I mean, you want more uh, reproducibility, but you also want to, to, to explore more. I think it really depends um, uh, on the use of the technology and, and, and where you are on, in, in your lab, if you are, I mean, pushing forward to have better models, or if you are happy with the model you have, um, in understanding the limitations, and it's, if it's useful for the question you're trying to answer. And, and is it the case with um, CRISPR-Cas9 that there are already <coughs> ways that that's done, so it, everyone has a standard way of, of using that technology? 
Um, I think even for Cas9 field, uh, we have some uh, standard technology people use every day. But in the meanwhile, the fields still move forward very fast, right? And they have kind of very precise gene editing now, and also like RNA-based gene editing. So in that scenario, there are always new technologies developing. I actually have a question for Matthias okay. because we're also interested in the organoids on chip model mm -hmm. and you just mentioned I think the trouble we had a lot is to find a common media to culture different yeah. organs together. But then we think back about that because different organs they are controlled in different micro environment and in human they are not really exposed to the same media, right? So they have the blood vessels contact it together. So Practically, I know it's definitely more complicated, but is that maybe a way to go so that in each organ they still have their own microenvironment, but you build something like a blood vessel or that it's, it's artificial the way, blood vessel. It's the, it's the way to go. Yeah. I think blood is sort of the common shared uh, yeah. <laughs> pool of nutrients and growth factor, and that's the reason why you know FBS works so well, because mm -hmm. it has all these things in it, so yeah. you can grow almost every type of cell. <laughs> but you want to get rid of it because it's very complex and, that's and really defined. But I think that's the idea here, that we're engineers and many groups are trying to uh, build a vasculature that can you know, be shared among multiple tissues. Yeah, I think that's exactly the, the approach. Yeah. Uh, I think the NIH has uh, lots of initiatives um, to build better uh, tissues in a chip. Yeah. by communicating to each other mm -hmm. through like um, uh, yeah I mean uh, by engineer connections that mimics this idea of blood vessels may not be the blood vessels per se but you are you're in touch at least the signals can can move from one tissue to another I mean, this is really exciting this is one point I want to add which I think is biologically and technically very interesting is that right now when we build organoids they're composed of largely one type of tissue. Yeah. Where they lack a lot of components from the real organ. And I think once you step, start to add these other components, for instance, if you have an epithelium and you add a mesenchyme, the, syst the system becomes more autonomous because there's crosstalk between the mesenchyme and the epithelium. And maybe that makes life actually easier once you then you know, want to com combine multiple organ models in one, in one setting. You so, see? So, so I think... It, the more complex an organoid becomes, the more autonomous it will probably be functioning. I think that's an interesting uh, yeah. challenge. Yeah. All right. Okay. So thank you for participating on this panel. Uh, it was a pleasure to hear about your science, and I think we end here. Okay.